What's up biology students? Mr. Holloway here. In today's video, we're going to talk about atoms, molecules, and atomic bonding. Atoms are small. Take the tip of your pencil for example. The stuff that we call lead is actually a substance called graphite, and graphite is pure carbon, meaning that it's made exclusively of carbon atoms. Let's say the tip of your pencil, if we were to break it off, has a mass of about one gram all on its own. That one gram of graphite contains over 50 sextillion atoms. That's over 50 billion sets of one trillion atoms each. That's a lot of atoms, and remember, that's in only one gram of graphite. Here we see the periodic table of elements. An element is a pure substance made up of only one kind of atom. So you can think of the periodic table as sort of a list of all the different kinds of atoms that we know about. Although all of these atoms are different in their composition, they are all made of the same basic stuff. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, or center of an atom, and these make up the bulk of an atom's mass. Protons have a positive electrical charge, and neutrons are neutral, meaning they have no electrical charge. Electrons have almost no mass, even by comparison to something as small and light as a proton. And electrons have a negative electrical charge. Electrons are found outside the nucleus of an atom in a cloud that surrounds the nucleus. This cloud contains different orbitals, or energy levels, and electrons move around in these energy levels at nearly the speed of light. So all atoms are made of these three subatomic particles, just in different quantities. The main difference between atoms comes from how many protons they have in the nucleus. And as we read the periodic table from left to right and top to bottom, the number of protons in the nucleus increases. Let's take a look at hydrogen, the simplest and most basic atom on the periodic table. Hydrogen contains only one proton in the nucleus and one electron in the electron cloud that surrounds the nucleus. Some forms of hydrogen contain one or two neutrons as well, but we'll come back to that point in a minute. That's why the atomic number of hydrogen is one, and for any element, this number always refers to the number of protons that the atom has in its nucleus. The atomic symbol for hydrogen is H, and we often use the atomic symbol as an abbreviation for this kind of atom. For example, water is called H2O, H2 for two atoms of hydrogen, and O for one atom of oxygen. And every water molecule in existence is made up like this. The atomic mass of an atom is determined by how many protons and neutrons the average atom of this kind contains, because both protons and neutrons contribute to an atom's mass, while electrons do not. Remember when I said that some forms of hydrogen contain one or even two neutrons? Well, these different forms are called isotopes. Any atom that has only one proton in the nucleus is going to be a hydrogen atom. But these hydrogen atoms can contain different numbers of neutrons. The vast majority of hydrogen atoms have no neutrons and have an atomic mass of one AMU, or one atomic mass unit. But some hydrogen atoms have one neutron in the nucleus as well, and have an atomic mass of two AMUs. Some hydrogen atoms contain two neutrons in the nucleus and have an atomic mass of three AMUs. The atomic mass of hydrogen, according to the periodic table, is 1.01 AMUs, because that's the average mass of a hydrogen atom. And that's because the vast majority of hydrogen atoms have a mass of only one AMU, and only a small fraction have a mass of two or three AMUs. Carbon, the single most important element for living things. Carbon has an atomic number of six, meaning it always contains six protons in the nucleus. It also has an atomic mass of 12.01 AMUs, which is the average mass of a carbon atom based on how many protons and neutrons it contains. Here we see some of the isotopes, or different forms of carbon. The vast majority of carbon atoms have six protons and six neutrons, and we call these kinds of atoms carbon-12. But a small percentage of carbon atoms have six protons and seven neutrons, so we call them carbon-13, and some even have six protons and eight neutrons and are called carbon-14. This last one, carbon-14, is radioactive and is the isotope we use in carbon dating. And carbon dating can tell us how old certain carbon-based substances are. In this diagram, we can also see those different electron energy levels I was talking about earlier. 
Electrons start by filling in the lower energy levels, and once that energy level is full, they start filling in the higher energy levels. The first energy level can only hold two electrons, which is why all of these isotopes have only two electrons in their inner circle. The second and third energy levels can each hold up to eight electrons. Since carbon has six protons, or six positive charges in its nucleus, a neutral atom of carbon will also have six negatively charged electrons to balance them out. Two of those electrons fill in the first and lowest energy level, and the remaining four electrons occupy the second energy level, as we can see here in this diagram. Electrons, especially the outermost electrons, have everything to do with how atoms bond to other atoms to form bigger, more complex structures. To better understand this point, let's take a look at how a water molecule is formed. Like I said earlier, every water molecule in the universe is made up of two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom, which is why water is also called H2O, H2 for two hydrogen atoms and O for one oxygen atom. As you can see in this diagram, hydrogen atoms have one electron in their outermost or valence energy level. Oxygen, which contains eight protons in the nucleus and eight electrons in the electron cloud, has six electrons in its outer shell. That's because two of the eight electrons fill up the first energy level, or shell, and the remaining six electrons have to occupy the second energy level, or shell. So far, so good. Well, there's an interesting thing about atoms. They like to have a full outer shell whenever possible, although it's important to note that we are anthropomorphizing a bit when we say that, because it's impossible for an atom to actually like anything. But atoms are more stable when their outer shell is as full as it can be. So, since oxygen could hold up to eight electrons in that second outermost shell, it's sort of like it has two empty spaces in that shell that it would like to fill up. Hydrogen, has only one electron in its outer shell, but it could hold two electrons in that shell. And so it would like to have two electrons to fill up that shell and make it more stable. So these atoms will actually share electrons in order to make that happen. Each hydrogen atom shares one electron with the oxygen atom, and the oxygen atom shares one electron with each of the hydrogen atoms, and an atomic bond is formed. This kind of an atomic bond is called a covalent bond. And this is how molecules form from individual atoms. A molecule is made up of two or more atoms bonded together with covalent bonds. And it is the sharing of electrons that holds these atoms together in a molecule. The more electrons that are shared, the stronger the bond will be. Here are a few more examples of simple molecules formed by covalent bonds, including hydrogen gas, or H2, for two hydrogen atoms bonded together. Oxygen gas, which is the gas that we need to breathe, or O2, for two oxygen atoms bonded together. Water, or H2O, which we just learned about. And methane, or CH4, for one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. If two atoms are sharing two electrons, as was the case with hydrogen and oxygen in a water molecule, we call this a single bond because each individual atom is contributing only one electron to the covalent bond. If two atoms are sharing four electrons, as is in the case with the two oxygen atoms we see here in the oxygen gas molecule, we call that a double bond because each individual atom is contributing two electrons to the covalent bond. There are also triple bonds in which each atom contributes three electrons to the covalent bond for a total of six shared electrons, but we can't see any examples of that in this particular figure. But that's not the only way that atomic bonds can form. Atomic bonds can also form when electrons are transferred between atoms, instead of just shared. We call these ionic bonds, because when an atom gains or loses an electron and takes on an electrical charge, we call that atom an ion. Here's an example. Sodium, which has the atomic symbol Na, has only one electron in its outer shell. Remember when I said that atoms like to have a full outer shell? Well, the same rule applies here, and in order to accomplish that, sodium loses a single electron from its outer shell. Now, since that outer shell has no electrons, it's like it doesn't exist, and the next highest shell is already full, so sodium is happy, or more accurately, we would say that sodium is stable. Along comes chlorine, and chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. All chlorine needs is one extra electron to fill up that outer shell, so it takes the electron that the sodium atom gave up. 
Now, both atoms are happy, or more stable, because they both have a full outer shell of electrons. But they are also both electrically charged. Since sodium lost one negatively charged electron, that means it has 11 protons and only 10 electrons for an overall charge of plus one. Chlorine has 17 protons and 18 electrons since it gained an extra electron and thus has a charge of negative one. Just like the opposite poles on a magnet, things with opposite electrical charges are attracted to one another. So the positively charged sodium ion is attracted to the negatively charged chlorine ion and this attraction is what causes these ions to stick together in an ionic bond. Table salt, or sodium chloride, is formed in this manner. And if we were to zoom way in on a single crystal of salt, we would find an alternating pattern of positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chlorine ions, as depicted here in these figures. It's also interesting to note that sodium chloride behaves very different than either sodium or chlorine do on their own. By themselves, sodium is an explosively reactive metal, and chlorine is a poisonous, toxic gas. But put the two together, and you have a substance that is not only harmless and edible, but which is also necessary for life. We wouldn't be able to survive without at least a little bit of sodium chloride in our diets. So, in summary, all matter is made of atoms, and all atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The number of protons is what defines an atom and its electrons allow it to bond with other atoms to form molecules and compounds necessary for supporting and maintaining life on this planet. When atoms share electrons, that's called a covalent bond, and that's how molecules are formed. When atoms completely transfer electrons, gaining or losing them, they become electrically charged ions, and these ions stick together in ionic bonds, forming compounds like table salt and a great many other important compounds as well. These ideas make up the basis of our understanding of matter and of chemistry. Life, as it turns out, is one giant chemistry experiment, and there are literally millions of chemical reactions occurring inside of you right now, controlling everything from digestion to our emotions and consciousness. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks again for watching, and remember that you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need to until you feel like you understand the concepts. See you next time!